Okay, uh, so welcome everybody uh, to today's um, ADEC program panel. Uh, my name is uh, Oliver Grantman, and uh, we will be kind of wrapping up and summarizing the Ad Future conference uh, that uh, took place last May um, at Oregon State University. So it's already about a month ago, but it was a very successful meeting. We had around 80 attendees there. Uh, and uh, the, the theme, as you know, of uh, the conference um, it was global engagement in online learning, insights, perspectives, and best practices. Uh, it was mainly a, an American audience, a, a, a U.S. audience, but we had uh, uh, some folks coming in from China and from Europe as well. So uh, overall, I think uh, most of the attendees were pretty satisfied. Uh, with, uh, with the meeting, uh, and I see that Dave is joining in as well. Hello there, Dave. How are you doing? Greetings. How are you all doing? Doing fine. Thank you. So uh, this, uh, this program panel is just kind of a, kind of a summary of what we, what we were covering. I'll go over each of the presenters uh, really quickly, and then uh, we'll have some time to discuss uh, for those who were attending uh, who were able to attend to to go a little bit over your impressions, and uh, I'll also go over some of the survey results uh, that I would like to share with everybody um, from the survey that we took after the conference. So uh, the symposium started on uh, Tuesday, uh, May 26. And uh, after Dave King provided uh, the opening remarks, we had the keynote address uh, given by Amin Kazi from uh, Unison Consortium. And basically, uh, the keynote address really uh, addressed uh, the, the current situation of the university higher education system in the United States and how Unison Consortium actually provides a collaborative environment for different universities to come together, share resources, and utilize basically uh, different uh, third-party providers as well. So it's kind of a levering, uh, leveling uh, playing field. Uh, and uh, I, I think that the keynote address overall was very helpful to provide some insights in how higher education institutions can really work together to share resources. Uh, if you have um, uh, experiences in certain areas, then you can share that basically within the Unison Consortium with uh, other uh, members. And uh, I think that um, Amin really uh, brought that across very well, what the benefits are of uh, collaborating uh, on, on that platform and, and also sharing best practices and uh, furthermore uh, investing basically into uh, shared resources. Um, so I think he gave us a very good overview, and actually his talk will be available online uh, on YouTube. I am still uh, converting files at the moment, and I'm running into some issues in that regard. Um, I'm using Camtasia, so if anybody has a better solution how I can convert some of these videos into an acceptable format, I'm, I'm open to that. Um, now I take it aside from Dave, actually, and nobody else who's attending the, uh, the program panel today was able to attend the ADEC at Future Conference, if I'm correct, right? Uh, Bryn and Erica and John, you, you all were not able to attend the conference, right? Oh, Erica, you were there, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yep, I was there. <laughs> Okay, so Erica, what was what is your impression of of the uh, keynote address uh, that Amin offered us? Oh no, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it was great. I actually it got me really excited for the rest of the conference, and um, yeah, I I guess um, I don't know. I don't I don't really have anything specific to say. I, I really appreciated, I think, just his ideas about collaboration and um, how I could be thinking a little bit differently in terms of our online programs um, and just expanding my way of thinking about them, I suppose. Yeah, I think he, he provided... And, and, his, and his travel story. <laughs> and his, yeah. <laughs> <To get there. laughs> Poor guy. Uh, but I think he's, he's he must be doing better now, uh, I hope at least, that he's not... 
he wasn't yeah. contagious from what I remember uh, when he, uh, when no, he was giving no. his talk. But, but yeah, we, we're trying new things. We're just um, at Oregon Tech, we're kind of getting into some blended learning. And then um, I noticed some of the people from Oregon Tech that are attending this right now, we've all been talking a little bit about um, some even alternate options other than just the standard blended hybrid and a little more into more of the flipped or other models. So I, I appreciated his ideas about um, about other other opportunities. And we've also been talking a little bit about badging and that sort of thing as well. So. Yes, and, and badging, we had another presentation that was uh, the next day uh, where Chris LaBelle and Lindsay uh, uh, Vaughn presented uh, some very interesting uh, uh, concepts, I think, uh, on badging. So uh, I think he really provided, you know, collaboration is kind of where, where ADAC is also located, where, where we see, you know, where we want to bring different institutions together. And I think that was really a, a great start for the conference. I definitely agree, Erica. Thank you for your insights. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Jolena, uh, you were able to join us. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you were not able to attend the conference, right? Right. Okay, so, so I just kind of want to try to figure out what happened. Okay, what happened? Yeah. Uh, well, it was quite successful, and uh, uh, you can uh, certainly. I, I hope that this little overview will provide you a little bit with insights uh, and get you uh, get you interested in in future events uh, that ADEC will be having. Um, I will put the keynote address up on the interwebs uh, later on. I'm still converting files, so that takes a little bit longer with my laptop. But uh, this, uh, this the keynote address will be available and uh, some of the other uh, talks as well for later on. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, so the first session then um, was started by uh, Jonan Donaldson from the Oregon State University and he talked about constructivism as a theoretical foundation for online learning and uh, I think he really took a very nice uh, instructional design approach uh, took us through all of the different motions of different uh, approaches and learning theories and what he considers currently the best approach to uh, to uh, blended learning, to flipped classrooms, to uh, collaborative learning and how constructivism can provide uh, a very good foundation for that. So he actually extended it, in, in my opinion, beyond just the theoretical foundation uh, more into the practical realm because at the end he gave uh, some uh, some examples of courses that he uh, helped to design and also was teaching. Uh, he was talking about um, um, uh, writing assignments and collaborative group work uh, online um, that really fits very well in this uh, constructivist approach. And I think at some point he was talking about a constructivist constructivism uh, theory because uh, uh, kind of like a like a little bit of a of a Russian doll approach where you basically look at it from the perspective of um, how can a student as a constructivist learn from the constructivist approach in the actual setting. So I really enjoyed his talk in that regard, um, and uh, that was also reflected in some of the uh, the feedback we received from attendees. Um, anybody who was attending, I know that Erica now and, and Dave were attending, want to chip in on this one? I think the only thing that I'd add to that, uh, uh, Oliver, was that uh, it seemed like the timing was right. I think you guys did a great job in kind of uh, uh, aligning who spoke when on the schedule because uh, one of the things I heard most from the hallway conversation was, wasn't it great to have uh, Jonan's conversation about uh, constructivism early enough in the process so that you could start thinking about that as you listen to some of the other papers that were being delivered. Yeah, I also, I really, really appreciated uh, Jonan's um, talk just because I think it's it's an aspect, and I, I made this com comment at the conference too, it's an aspect of, um, I'd say, online pedagogy that we don't often discuss is the theoretical background. I think a lot of times we think a lot about policy and course management and course design and all that, but when it really comes down to the theoretical foundation, it, I thought that was really enlightening and kind of refreshing to talk about. And I think from the perspective of faculty or administrators or policy makers, uh, we often are, like you, like you said, Erica, and, and like, like Dave, you also said, uh, we, we don't think necessarily about uh, that there is actually 
theories, learning theories out there that we can uh, systemically uh, utilize uh, either to build for a single course or even to apply to a whole setting, to the online setting, to the flipped classroom, uh, where we can really strategically apply these learning theories to help uh, both students and instructors, and specifically instructors. If you look at faculties uh, that do not have any educational experience before, that don't have any training in educational theory, uh, I think for those, it's it's definitely very helpful to get like a at least a an overview of what teaching philosophies and theories are out there that they can then apply uh, systemically in a, in a more systemic setting rather than just um, pick and choose kind of among uh, tools that are available and just draw these technologies in to to make their their classroom better. So I, I think. Um, and especially uh, the the importance of utilizing instructional designers when you start setting up a course uh, was was highlighted by John and very well I think. Agreed. Okay, and then uh, next it was kind of also policy related, so kind of uh, overview related in in that same session. Uh, was uh, the talk by Cindy Hart from West Virginia University, Corporation Collaboration and Compliance. And this mainly focused on the implementation of quality matters uh, into specifically the online programs, not uh, only at West Virginia University, but uh, the state of Virginia, uh, West Virginia as a whole. Um, and uh, she really gave some practical uh, kind of examples of where they face certain hurdles, uh, they still kind of in the process of completely implementing quality matters and uh, it was kind of interesting to see uh, how uh, what kind of especially in terms of uh, implementation uh, issues uh, what they were first facing so certain faculty members uh, were initially kind of um, trendsetters they came on board very early uh, and others were kind of still behind and uh, and they did an internal quality control process uh, that was internally reviewed before they actually put it up uh, for quality matters review and it was kind of interesting that you saw kind of an evolution of initially there were a lot of uh, the uh, courses and programs uh, were uh, kind of pushed back again and and had to go through a more in uh, detailed review and then uh, as faculty caught up with these quality matters rubrics uh, they became much more familiar and involved with um, uh, with implementing, really systemically implementing uh, these standards. So I think that was a very helpful discussion. Uh, and it, it also showed definitely after Cindy finished her talk uh, in the, uh, uh, directly following the, the Q&A that we had, uh, that um, there is still a lot of interest and need for uh, establishing frameworks uh, across different universities, across different institutions, across different programs. Um, that kind of establish a, a foundation for how we implement uh, not only online programs, but programs across the board and courses. Erica, Dave, any input in that? Uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, one of the, uh, and if uh, those of you who are on today are looking for opportunities to kind of develop collaboration and cooperation, which was, you know, really one of the functional kind of uh, uh, underpinnings to the to the whole symposium but the unique thing with West Virginia University's program is that they're very focused on uh, uh, articulations with community colleges and so if you're thinking about uh, at your own institution how uh, you might improve and increase the, your articulation uh, West Virginia would be a good one to connect with Great. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I also think in general, uh, because as, as you can see from uh, uh, from the program, we basically uh, almost after every second talk, uh, we had small breaks. Uh, so we had 15 minute breaks. And I think that the networking uh, that was going on throughout the day uh, was just outstanding. It was incredible that there was a lot of interaction uh, between uh, folks from different institutions, uh, knowledge exchange uh, that was uh, was really involving uh, many people, and I think that was really it was for me it was just um, 
exciting to see that knowledge exchange going on um, there in front of uh, in front of me, and uh, uh, that's that's really was the great benefit. And I think the the size of the of the attendance, 80, 80 people roughly, uh, really is is a is a good size for having these networking and knowledge exchange conversations uh, uh, in between the breaks. Uh, and and uh, many of the discussions then kind of evolved around um, the presentations that were given and extended from there. So um, I think that was that was really something uh, that was really really helpful. And some of, of the feedback that uh, I received that I saw in in the survey was that uh, folks would like to see roundtable discussions or even more of these networking uh, opportunities. Uh, throughout the uh, the symposium in the future, so um, we hear you and uh, we'll work on that. <laughs> okay, after a lunch break, then um, we had the second session uh, that day, and uh, the first presenter was Maru Fakri uh, from Labster, uh, a virtual laboratory uh, company, a private company located in Denmark, and uh, he was talking about uh, basically using uh, gamified uh, laboratory simulations or virtual laboratories uh, to improve science teaching and engaging students uh, through their uh, virtual laboratories. And uh, he kind of took a, took a different approach uh, to his uh, talk. He really started off with uh, his involvement and how he got excited about science teaching in general and uh, uh, kind of uh, made us aware of um, that uh, we all kind of tend to have a certain um, uh, propensity for, for, for gaming or drawn into certain areas uh, via uh, gaming. Um, and I think um, he, he really highlighted some of the key features of what it means to be engaged uh, in, a, in a science uh, classroom. And obviously the benefits uh, of the virtual laboratory that he presented is uh, he, he well, what, what LAPS is doing at the moment is more uh, basically supplementing um, hands-on laboratories. Uh, so students first uh, go through the virtual laboratory where they are provided with certain scenarios and uh, along the way where they process the samples basically and do all of these activities, uh, they can always bring up background knowledge. Uh, there are little quizzes that they can do. They can compete with each other to get a higher score. Um, to get uh, more points basically uh, by completing all of these these tasks basically and basically prepares them uh, for entering a hands-on laboratory. So uh, the, the benefits uh, that I saw immediately of this was really uh, cutting back on costs obviously. Um, so you, you can for example introduce basic safety procedures, you can introduce uh, certain lab procedures that they can then basically follow step by step virtually first and then uh, do it hands-on later on in the laboratory. Um, and uh, I think his talk was in general just uh, quite impressive. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, for me, it generated some, some interesting uh, aspects. I was later on talking to somebody else uh, who was attending from UF who uh, even thinks a step further and says, why can't we uh, bring uh, virtual laboratories to the to the table as a potential tool to potentially replace uh, hands-on laboratories. So he wants to uh, kind of uh, even potentially apply for funding uh, to test uh, the hypothesis if virtual laboratories can provide the same um, uh, the same skills as a hands-on uh, laboratory would provide uh, to students. So uh, that was a very exciting aspect for me. Uh, Erica, Dave, what uh, what was your uh, perception? Your uh, opinion? I I really enjoyed Maruf's talk actually because uh, Oregon Tech has lots of engineering and laboratory science uh, classes in general and we're starting to see more and more of those coming online so again that was um, a real highlight for me just to see other ways that it's possible to offer lab sciences and um, I know he was talking about um, in the future developing engineering labs online and we're already starting to do that a little bit so um, it was just exciting to see see what other people are doing and how they're managing it and, and doing it as well. And I shared that with a lot of the faculty, um, a lot of his information and um, what he's doing with a lot of our faculty who teach those courses, like anatomy and physiology and chemistry, um, the engineering, electrical engineering, those sorts of classes. So I thought it was exciting and fun. Erica, do you yeah, think... Oh, presenter. sorry. I think one of the... Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. <laughs> 
Uh, one, of, one of the things that uh, I think was unique uh, to the symposium, and you guys, uh, Oliver, did a great job on this, is to mix um, some of the vendor partners into the mix, like uh, Labster, um, and how they could become better partners in our efforts. So I, I thought that the, he was a great pre presenter, and it was a good talk, and, but I think it was also interesting to see that he was a unique kind of player um, in the in the mix of things uh, at the symposium. Yeah, in that regard, we were very fortunate to have received uh, uh, abstracts from a very diverse field of speakers, uh, um, and and I I'm really thankful for for the attendance that we had and uh, the the speakers that you know stepped forward. Uh, I think aside from the Chinese delegation uh, for Cabot's uh, Maruf was the only international speaker that was there, uh, and he traveled uh, basically from Denmark to uh, uh, to give the give the talk. So uh, yeah, that was definitely. So there, there's probably for for me personally, there's probably more to to come out of this uh, out of his presentation in the future. So I'm I'm really excited about that. Um, okay, so unfortunately, the this, the the third international speaker um, that was supposed to talk uh, right after Maruf uh, wasn't able to attend uh, from Abu Dhabi. Uh, so we had kind of an uh, an impromptu uh, open session where we just talked about international outreach and how uh, different institutions what their experience is with international outreach. Um, and a collaboration with institutions uh, outside of the United States. And obviously, um, uh, Oregon State and Dave uh, had, um, uh, have established a, a very strong collaboration already with, with Cabot's, with uh, their Chinese uh, partners that were part of uh, the uh, ADEX Symposium um, and later attended and, and gave uh, also a talk. Um, and uh, I, I think that there is still a lot more that we can do as uh, as institutions to try to establish international collaborations on different levels, no matter if that's related to a single program, if it's a, a student or faculty exchange, or if it's uh, in the online field, in the online and distance field, uh, I feel that, uh, that certain hurdles are already kind of uh, broken down uh, when you when you want to collaborate online. Uh, so um, at, at University of Florida, we've got collaborations with uh, folks in Australia in in the United Kingdom and, and now in the Netherlands. And um, we feel that uh, there is still some reluctance, uh, especially in the European countries in reaching out and collaborating online. Uh, but they also see the need for it because you you cannot have all the expertise necessarily on every topic on uh, um, in-house, uh, so why not uh, kind of reach out to other institutions um, that can provide and supplement um, that expertise? So, uh, and obviously, uh, when it comes to extension, and that's where where um, where Oregon State uh, was uh, definitely heavily involved. Um, the agricultural outreach that uh, Dave King has with uh, with China is outstanding, and I think it's a it's a shining light in that regard uh, when it comes to uh, really a lot of effort and a lot of um, persistence being put into uh, to come to to the point where you are at now, Dave, with with the with the Cabot's folks. Well, I appreciate the kind words. It's uh, it's been uh, an, an interesting ride, that's for sure. Um, you know, when I talk about this kind of collaboration um, in other venues like uh, the Association for Public and Land-Grant Universities and, uh, and international programs areas and things like that, the first question that surfaces is what do we get out of it? And uh, I think uniquely the collaboration that we're working on has the potential to uh, get us to a point where we would generate, uh, you know, a, a significant number of learning modules, which could then be sold jointly between Cabot's and, uh, and our, uh, co our consortium um, and generate revenue from, uh, from the community colleges or community-like colleges uh, in the provinces around, around China. We're a long ways from that, but we do have a, a you know, we're on a trajectory towards trying to get to that point where there really is a mutual uh, benefit to, uh, to everybody involved. 
Well, there is definitely a lot of potential if you look at the at the numbers there from what you described. Uh, you have uh, basically, uh, I don't know, uh, roughly a million farmers or so that uh, that are present there, right? That's what you mentioned. Actually, the number is 900 million. <laughs> More than every man, woman, and child in the United States. That's what I, I remember coming back and thinking that, and I thought, I must be wrong. <laughs> no, that, I guess I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that can't be right. But uh, yeah, the, the issue is um, that the, the average farm size is very small. So the uh, average farm size in China is uh, 0.7 hectares. That would be about two acres, two or so acres. Um, and so that's why the uh, focus, uh, especially during the end of the uh, symposium, on the small farm programs, because what we do in the United States for small uh, landowners, small uh, land holders, um, is very similar to what they need over there. And I think in, in that regard, um, Sam and Gino's talk was uh, was quite interesting, um, and also uh, David Hannigan's talk, and we'll we'll, we'll get to that in a, uh, a little bit. Um, so uh, let's continue down here. Um, on the third session, um, we actually had a little bit of a change here. Uh, we changed things up a little bit. Um, so uh, Michael Abiyati uh, wasn't able to make it on that day, so we had to change him out uh, with somebody else. And uh, so the first one actually uh, in, in, in this session uh, was Stefan Müller uh, from the University of California in Irvine. And he comes from a completely different approach uh, when he talked about um, racing technology redesigning the 21st century online learning. He's mainly involved uh, with, uh, with languages. So he was talking, uh, he was, uh, he's teaching French basically uh, in the extension there and, and the business programs. And uh, it was quite interesting how he described the different technological tools that he has been using in his classroom uh, to get students involved. So uh, th it was a mix of asynchronous, synchronous interactions. Uh, he introduced uh, group uh, presentations and group activities. Um, he uh, focused on, I think he mentioned Big Blue Button um, uh, as, a, as a chat feature that he used for synchronous discussions. Um, and I think in general, his, his, his talk was just very inspiring. He had a lot of energy and uh, was kind of convening that uh, even with languages, which is very intricate, um, both the, the writing perspective and, and the, uh, the speaking perspective were, were addressed very appropriately with the technologies he was using. Um, Erica, do you want to say something about that? I thought I heard I you on. I don't have too much to add to that. that, that nope, nope. <laughs> no, I think you, you pretty much covered it. Yeah, that was, he was fun. He was a great speaker. Yeah, he was just very, uh, I, I would call him inspirational because I would, I, from my perspective, you know, from a science teacher perspective, I, I wouldn't know where to start when it comes to teaching uh, languages online. So uh, it was definitely a very, fresh perspective uh, and take on uh, uh, on this kind of setting. So I, I enjoyed his talk very much. Um, next in that uh, session were uh, Sarah Jameson and Tian Hong Shi from Oregon State University. And uh, I, I really liked the dynamic between the two of them as they were discussing the different aspects of uh, designing online collaborations and the lessons they learned from developing critical thinking and analytical writing skills for collaboration on online courses. Um, I think uh, Tian Hong was uh, describing more the instructional design perspectives, how to design the course, and Sarah, uh, as the instructor, was focusing on um, the, the actual learning experience that she got out of it and how she systematically utilized the tools that, she, that, that were available to her to really get students uh, involved. And, and hers was a, a writing class um, on the, uh, I think it was the uh, undergraduate level, a, a scientific writing class, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I, I, might be, um, I might be wrong on that one. Uh, and, and was it? Yeah, that's correct. OK, yeah. And I think she got a lot of students from very different areas 
uh, to actually take this class. And uh, uh, her experience was that uh, students were almost more engaged with each other because they really provided a lot of peer review interactions. Uh, she obviously was involved in reviewing and providing feedback to students. And I think she, she, uh, she described herself as a skeptic in the beginning herself. Uh, but as uh, the course was developed and, and just blossomed and students were really interacting with each other, I think they, uh, she really uh, got to appreciate the many tools that were available that made her life uh, and the students' life uh, kind of easier and, and more fun to interact. And Tian Hong provided kind of the, um, the, uh, the instructional design perspective and how to uh, really apply what Sarah wanted to incorporate uh, via, via using different technologies within the learning management system uh, to, uh, to provide students with that degree of interaction and collaboration. Uh, so I, I enjoyed that talk as well. I, hopefully I will be able to upload that as well. I'm still working uh, out the, the kinks here on my end, but I should have that uh, available pretty soon. Um, Erica, anything to add on your end? No, I, I would be looking forward to that one being loaded online or available online because I would like to share it with our communication faculty who are actively developing courses right now, similar to the ones that they were talking about for online. So. I, I personally think that uh, critical it's thinking... It's actually our smallest offering, so yeah. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that can expand. <laughs> so uh, I actually think that critical thinking skills and also analytical writing skills are, are just critical, are, are really central for no matter what area you, you're going to work in later on. So I think uh, that I would, I would almost make that a requirement for every undergraduate student if you ask me, but and that's just me. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, well, but but uh, what what might be happening obviously is as you scale that up, and I think uh, her um, her class size was limited. Was there was a cutoff at some point by thirty or so? I don't know exactly how many were in her class, but obviously if you scale that up and make it you know really a, a major required class across campus, then you need many many sections of that class in order to still provide the same degree of interaction and direct interaction between teacher and students. So. Uh, there is probably a little bit of a scaling component that you need to be aware of the, with uh, you know, a class where the teacher has to be involved and provides individualized feedback. Okay. Um, yes, agreed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the, uh, and then there was a third speaker and we kind of uh, jumped on uh, Jamaica Glenn uh, from Harbing and Knowledge Products um, uh, and basically moved her uh, her talk up to uh, Tuesday afternoon. So she actually talked on eight seconds to learn engagement. And uh, she was a, a provider. She was there with a, with a booth as well at, at the symposium. And uh, she basically uh, described the use of uh, different uh, smaller kind of tools that can be easily integrated that uh, kind of also uh, have a gaming aspect to them that uh, kind of uh, gamifies learning. Um, and I, I think it was mainly geared towards maybe high school and undergraduate uh, introductory courses. Um, and there was a little bit of skepticism in the audience, I had the impression, uh, as to how this can be applied and be meaningful related to the topics that you try to teach. And um, obviously, if you use something like a memory puzzle or something like that, then you need to tie it into uh, what you're trying, what you want students to, to get out of it. Uh, so there needs to be the tools that she introduced need to be applicable and need to fit into the particular learning outcomes and objectives that you want to set. Uh, but I think uh, the general notion that learner engagement is something that you need to be doing from the beginning on uh, and, 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 and really need to make clear that um, most of the activities will be learner centered. Um, and I think that is a shift in, in, is a paradigm shift in general uh, that we need to be aware of in education, um, that it's not a lecture style one way, uh, somebody is just standing in, in the front of the lecture hall and is just lecturing uh, and uh, kind of students serve as a passive uh, kind of passive intake uh, of, of the knowledge, but it's really shifting more responsibility 
um, towards the students of, uh, of engaging with the material, engaging with the teacher. That was kind of the takeaway I got, I got from her. Um, Dave, Erica, what was your perspective? What, was Jamaica the one who her, um, her, what she was trying to demonstrate wasn't quite working? Yes. The flash. Yes, okay, she had some yeah, issues no, with that. I really, I remember her very clearly. I really actually liked what she had to say, and I, I, I must admit, I felt a little bit bad for her at the end because um, there was a lot of people kind of arguing against using um, different types of, like, interactive technology like she was showing us. Uh, uh, just because it's available doesn't mean we should use it. And I thought she she was fair about that. I didn't think she was saying, it's here, you should use it just because it's available. But I do think exactly what you said, Oliver, that um, that if there are ways and it, it does involve technology to engage students, I don't think we should, would, should just shut the door on them <laughs> because they're new or flashy. I think if they can help engage our students and um, provide better learning outcomes and help them meet those outcomes, I think that they're definitely viable options. It, it's not for everyone or everything, but um, yeah, I, I felt a little bad for her at the end. <laughs> yeah, that was my impression as well. Just to, just to <laughs> Sorry. The point she made, and I would just was uh, was the fact that uh, whether we like it or not, our learners are coming to us expecting that kind of interaction, and uh, that's uh, you know that's, that's the game we play now. Right. The, those are the rules of the game now. So get over it and get on with it. Right. And just because, yeah, exactly. Just because, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, if you think about it, uh, most of us probably grew up uh, with some sort of video game uh, and uh, they are usually quite flashy and they kind of take you from a very easy, basic approach. You know, you, you get kind of hooked into the game and then they take you to more complicated tasks. Uh, and I think that's kind of what, 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 what you said, Erica and Dave, is kind of where, where things are going. That's just an expectation that students have. Um, and uh, yeah, at some point we have to meet that uh, and having such tools available in some fashion or another uh, will, will assist us in that, in that effort. So yeah, agreed. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I appreciated that. I've, I've heard other arguments about um, th those types of learner engagement and even gamified learning options and how that improves retention. I haven't seen any research and studies about how it does work and um, support learning outcomes and that sort of thing. I'd be interested in, in seeing some, some eventual, eventual studies about retention or um, engagement from students from this type of, of option for students. But it seems fun to me <laughs> and great, a great opportunity. Well, what, what I have seen recently emerge uh, is, well, there, there are kind of two approaches, I think. One is, uh, do you have a very, um, very organized and structured approach where you have kind of a linear learning outcome? So it's, it's both focused on one learning outcome or one objective, uh, like these little games, you know, where you have memory tasks or stuff like that. Or is it a very open, experimental, do-whatever-you-feel-like environment, such as Minecraft, for example, which has taken off... Uh, like like nothing I've seen before in, in the middle school and high school environment where students really explore uh, completely out in the open and, uh, and, and can craft quite, I, I mean, they really get uh, expert, uh, get little experts in, in, in certain areas and still have to apply scientific uh, principles to it. Uh, so that's what I've seen. And there's actually some research out on that, Erica, that I'm happy to to share with you. Uh, if you can, if you just want to email me, I can can write my email address. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, uh, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, I mean, it's probably not translating as well into higher education settings um, because Minecraft is um, is mainly geared towards middle and high school exploration, and that's where it really has a, a solid foundation now. Uh, but um, I like the concept of this open kind of open area exploring. And I, I also actually, going back to uh, Maru Fakri's talk, uh, uh, the Labster talk, uh, I, that's what I would like to see eventually, that you have a virtual laboratory environment where, uh, aside from a few environmental variables, students can really do what they want and, and can explore and can even come to wrong conclusions. And we're not yet there that we have the artificial kind of intelligence or the, the, the kind of iterations or algorithms that allows for that. 
But uh, that's what I would like to see eventually, that really you can you know, explore uh, in, a, in a very safe environment um, and, and reach conclusions and, and, and just basically go through your own steps and explore your own, you know, your own mistakes and, and, and basically feel comfortable with making these mistakes. So, um, yeah. And then uh, on the 27th uh, in the morning, we started off uh, with uh, session four. And uh, here, uh, uh, Frenny Lee from ProQuest uh, um, uh provided us with some insights into copyright technologies for online initiatives. And what I liked about her talk, so she was always, uh, she was also represented in the back uh, with, a, with a booth uh, during the conference. And what I really liked about her talk uh, was making um, faculty aware of uh, where actually copyright stands at the moment and what technologies could be utilized to help um, help faculty in, in figuring out uh, what kind of copyright applies to them and that they can still utilize the resources that they have been potentially uh, using uh, without permission before. Uh, so I, I think her approach was was really interesting, and and I like the concept. I'm not sure that it has been implemented that uh, that widely yet, uh, but uh, I think most uh, most instructors kind of go on an as needed basis. Um, but uh, I can definitely see how this can integrate with library resources at institutions um, that they can utilize basically uh, such services to uh, provide them to their faculty members. I don't know what uh, what is everybody else's experience with copyright uh, in uh, and faculty engagement and and how does faculty approach this issue? Well, here in Oregon State, we have I have somebody one person full time who clears copyright for faculty members who are developing online courses and. Uh, you know that's uh, that's a uh, uh, a lot of effort that goes into this. I think the best thing uh, descriptively that Franny said that day that is uh, that you know continues to stick with me and from some initial conversations I've had with them earlier than this, uh, but they're calling this the uh, the uh, iTunes of uh, copyrighted material. So where in the past you have to go in and buy the whole textbook or the whole uh, resource packet or go down to Kinko's and get the you know two inch thick set of copied uh, materials for your class that in this fashion you can buy it one piece at a time just like iTunes and in the long run it saves you know tons of money for the university but it also saves um, you know on average I think they said Three hundred thousand dollars a year for students. Do either of you remember what she said? It was a number in that range, anyway. And so this is a. I mean, we need to keep our eyes on this and see how this works because this is a very uh, important aspect of uh, of you know helping students be successful. Now, my question in that regard would be, uh, and and I didn't, I wasn't able to ask her that, but. Uh, would would the copyright also? I mean, obviously, whatever is created at a university it has the copyright of the university. But could there also be sharing of of that content between universities then? With with because there is obviously also a copyright issue associated with that, right? Any any resource like that that would be made available uh, for a fee someplace could be uh, incorporated into this and allowed to be uh, ac accessed for an individual use fee. You know, like the ninety-nine cents on i on iTunes. Yeah, ah, that's a that's a fascinating concept, um, and I definitely agree with you that that's gonna <laughs> gonna 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 have a, a huge impact. I mean, I already see it uh, with with our programs as well that students are complaining about high textbook costs and and all that stuff. And if you can bring that down by really just utilizing the content that you that you have to utilize out of that uh, textbook, then it definitely, um, definitely would help uh, a lot. I think students too, and I think you're right about about the costs uh, in regards to. But is that basically uh, then for all students on a campus, or did she? I'm not sure that she made a a size comparison. What what kind of uh, you know student population you're looking at? 
Well, the, the way it works is the university pays a, uh, a flat fee. Uh, you know, it was about ten thousand dollars when they were a startup. It's now twenty-five thousand dollars, and then, and then that provides uh, all of the students on campus access to all of the materials that are available within the uh, the scope of the of their program, which is everything that the library feels that uh, that you should have, and everything that all of your faculty members feel that you should have. Um, the, the important thing is that it also cuts down on the cost uh, of library subscriptions, so the library ends up paying less for uh, a whole lot of materials that very few students use, or students use so uh, infrequently that uh, the one or two uh, individual costs that a student would pay for access to it is, uh, is significantly less than what the university would pay to get the open access to everybody and have nobody use it. Yeah, and I've, I've seen that, that uh, there was uh, uh, basically that, that resources had been cut back because they had not been utilized, uh, but then it was basically a subset of, of the particular resources that were still quite frequently utilized, but the whole resource all of a sudden disappeared because the rest wasn't utilized. And obviously that would that would kind of, because it fragments that, like you said, uh, basically like a, an Apple iTunes store, it fragments that into little pieces that you can select. So I can right. definitely see the advantage of that. Uh, okay, Erica, any any comment from you? No, I, I don't think I have anything um, to add. It, it was an interesting conversation. We, we're a really small school, so we have our librarians manage a lot of our copyright issues right now and um, any questions that we have and our policies and that sort of thing. But it was an interesting thing looking forward since I am on the library commission or the library committee, I guess, for our school. So this is kind of an ongoing topic for us. Okay, great. Uh, now I have to have to admit that I don't know who um, who jumped in for Jamaica? Was it that we moved Eric up or was it, no, it was Chris, right? Chris Tellman? Do you guys remember? I'm trying to remember. So, yeah. I think it was Chris who moved up, right? Yep. Yes, yeah. Uh, so basically since uh, since Jamaica presented on, on Tuesday, we had to shuffle things a little bit around and uh, moved uh, Chris Tillman up uh, to delivering highly tailored support for post-traditional students at scale. Um, and I think that was another very interesting uh, talk about, and, and he's, uh, he's coming from the commercial sector inside track, um, and uh, really basically how do you optimize uh, the, from initially from the start basically where the student uh, enrolls in a program or is interested in a program, how do you kind of optimize the support uh, that, uh, that they can be provided with? And, he specifically focused on post-traditional students, uh, so this is not your incoming freshman, but really somebody who is who is out there who potentially is already a professional uh, working uh, a person who wants to go back to school and uh, wants to basically uh, stay connected. And what we usually see in that area is that a lot of students fall off the grid after a while because they simply cannot maintain that um, much more complex uh, work-life balance. And uh, I think he really made clear what I kind of took away from that uh, was uh, that there needs to be a connection between the student uh, with a support team. The support team includes, in this case, um, uh, the faculty member, uh, registration team, uh, any uh, technical issues that might arise. And Inside Track kind of um, provides a set of tools uh, that basically keep track of the student as they go through uh, through the first weeks, through the first months in the program, all the way through uh, their academic career, uh, and and really kind of highlights where potential um, uh, potential pitfalls or where potential critical steps can come in if some if a student doesn't participate in a class for the first two weeks or three weeks uh, that you reach out to them and and really try to see what's going on there. Um, so I think it, it was really interesting uh, not only to uh, decrease attrition uh, and increase retention, but also to establish a more personal uh, connection with the student. And uh, I think that's something that we have to have to realize as we scale many of these online programs or distance programs or 
uh, even blended classrooms sometimes, uh, the connection with the students still needs to be there. And it doesn't necessarily always need to be the faculty member, but there needs to be uh, some kind of uh, contact person that the student feels connected with. Um, obviously, what I was reminded of a little bit is kind of the, um, the behavior that some for-profit institutions have uh, established where they kind of, uh, kind of hunt down students. Uh, but this is, uh, this is very different from, from that. I think it's really an, uh, establishing a, a good uh, communication pathway with students. That was kind of my takeaway from, from his talk. Yeah, that, that's that's the fundamental aspect of, of what uh, of the kind of service that Chris and his group uh, brings to the table. That the uh, an adult learner who comes back after having been away from education for a while, the first two terms back are they are most at risk for not making it through, for not persisting, for not be retaining, being you know re uh, being uh, continuing on through that. And so what. What Inside Track does is provide a uh, a coach that will contact them either via text or on the phone or via email if they if they agree if they wish and just keep track of them and say hey uh, so you had the chemistry test last week how'd it go and uh, or you really you probably should talk to your advisor let me try to get them on the phone for you right now and give a hot hand up that kind of thing. We found here that if we were going to use, we were going to try to do this internally, it would take about 10 people. And there's no way I could hire 10 people, find a place to put them, et cetera. So uh, we used them for about a year and a half, and they did an excellent job. And retention went up enough so that the, uh, the fee they charged us was covered uh, clearly by the revenue generated by the retention increase. Yeah, I think if, if you approach it correctly and you're not being, you know, predatory, uh, and obviously he's not, uh, and that was very clear from his presentation, then you can you can learn quite a, a good deal from from that and really incorporate it into your overall kind of services, you know, uh, as you as you present your programs to uh, potential applicants and, and interested folks. So um, students don't know that these folks are from Inside Track. They think they're from Oregon State because they're. Basically, there are our people at that point. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, you basically hired them during that period, so yeah, makes sense. Okay, we are <laughs> we are almost already through, and we even uh, haven't uh, haven't discussed yet everything. But uh, let's let's try to cover as much as possible. So um, in session five, uh, we had Eric Triplett, and uh, he was presenting. Uh, on the increasing diversity in STEM through online education by research intensive university. Uh, he's also from the University of Florida and uh, he established basically a, a two and two program where uh, students from community colleges who dropped off uh, after they received their, um, their associate's degree uh, kind of tried to bring them back to the table with a two year um, two-year program in microbiology that prepares them basically for a career in health sciences. So he has particularly reached out to other community colleges in Miami and in other areas across the state of Florida and uh, basically established with them a program that allows those who did not have the means to finish their bachelor's degree to do so from a distance uh, campus. So they have some modules that uh, students have to take because it's a microbiology degree. So they have some lab, um, lab courses that they have to take at these community colleges at these satellite uh, campuses then basically then. And uh, other than that, all the other courses are online. And he really saw uh, already within the past, I don't know, three years or so that he has been running this uh, saw a, a very uh, good result overall from increasing retention and getting folks to finish their bachelor's degree and prepare them for uh, their career in health sciences. So those who want to go into medical school or uh, other professions uh, or to graduate school later on. Um, so uh, he, he was particularly reaching out to, uh, to uh, those students who were in um, in areas, uh, in rural areas, and that would otherwise not have been able to attend 
and finish their their bachelor's degree at an established uh, institution. So, and I think most of that what he did uh, came through an NSF grant, and uh, he's going strong now with the program, uh, and uh, still reaching out to other colleges. Uh, and I think it serves as a great model to really. Uh, establish, and I know that Oregon State has been doing it and other universities, um, where you basically try to, to uh, increase uh, the completion rate uh, of, of disadvantaged students in, in rural areas uh, by providing them with opportunities to continue their education uh, aside from, you know, while they are still working full time. And uh, I, I really liked his presentation in that regard because it, it shows that uh, you can definitely get students, uh, it's not necessarily students who don't want to learn, who don't want to finish, but it's just that they don't have the capabilities, the immediate capabilities and infrastructure available. And basically bringing that to the students in these rural settings or underprivileged settings uh, can, can make a big difference. Um, okay, yeah, go ahead. I want to, I'm going to bring him back by a web uh, webinar and have him talk to several of our deans here. I thought I thought his was one of the best content-wise, one of the best presentations of the sessions. Yeah, he definitely. Uh, I mean, he made a, a direct impact in the state of Florida with with what he has been doing across the state of Florida and especially in South Florida. And I think that's uh, that that can really serve as a model of what you could do in other areas uh, that are you know, mainly rural in nature. So um, the next talk was actually <laughs> Dave King's talk. So I, I let you summarize what, what you were talking about in that one, Dave. Well, I, I know we're running out of time. I'll just, I'll just say quickly that uh, this is a presentation that includes uh, three different people, myself plus uh, somebody from, uh, uh, from uh, Cal State Online and from Boise uh, State. Uh, and we come at how you take a program that's been built under the radar uh, up into the mainstream of, of the institution. How do you get uh, recognition? How do you get funding? How do you uh, manage the movement? And what value you get out of doing that? So it's, uh, it's a fun presentation. We've actually done it about three times now, and, and it, gets, uh, it gets better each time we do it. <laughs> I think you really uh, you really presented the different aspects that you need to think about uh, when you really uh, want to want to get something off the off the ground like this. Um, and uh, I think there was a lot of thought, uh, uh, food for thought in, in the presentation. And obviously, you always need to consider the the the, the partners uh, that are in play uh, and and the uniqueness of every you know of everything that you're doing in that regard. But um, I think it's just it's just uh, you know you need to consider some of the uh, the economic factors. You need to consider the the academic settings that you're working with. I think uh, it was it really provided a lot of a uh, lot of input and and insights in that regard. Thanks. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I really I really appreciated that talk. It was great. It gave me hope. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we are almost getting to the end here. Uh, so we actually had um, uh, Mike Abiyati uh, in, in that session here, um, in session six. Um, and I think we moved uh, the digital badging up into, into the session before. Um, so let me go really briefly over, over these three. Uh, digital badging in higher education and the private sector case study from Oregon, uh, presented by Chris LaBelle and Laura McKinney. And uh, I was really intrigued by this digital badging idea because I think it's it's visionary in in some regard that uh, uh, presenting basically across different platforms a uh, a unified system a badge that you can really take with you from place to place you don't have to necessarily provide written transcripts or stuff like that that kind of is visible uh, to future institutions that you apply to for a degree or to uh, employers. So no matter if it's professional development, if it's uh, certain skills that you acquired, uh, even if it's, you know, on a course by course basis, uh, I think that uh, if this, you know, if this really takes off, uh, then we better all get on board uh, pretty soon and, and, uh, uh, and figure out how we're gonna, gonna apply this system into, into the respective institutions. 
so I really liked like their presentation in that regard, and I'm actually in, in talks with Laura a little bit about um, uh, how this can be transferred uh, over into professional education. Erica, you mentioned at the beginning that you had some thoughts on this. Yeah, that's actually on my summer to-do list. Finals ended on Friday, so that's that's one of the first things I'm working on is just exploring our options for badging and which classes and series of classes would be good ones to start with. Badging seems like it's kind of a low-risk endeavor, so um, summer is a good time to research it and find out if it's something that'll work for us. We have a lot of a lot of online courses that students take as non-admits, um, just so uh, for pro professional development, career improvement, that sort of thing. So seems like a good fit, good option. Uh, Erica, if you want to, uh, because I, I talked to Laura briefly uh, a couple of weeks ago, and she got me in touch with somebody who uh, basically does that for a living, digital badging and, and creating that stuff. I can certainly get you in touch with him as well if you want to. Yeah, that would be great. And again, with the networking at this conference, I was able to, I was sitting with a few people during this presentation who also gave me some names of like a vendor um, and then uh, some other options. Right now, all I've explored is through Blackboard and through Mozilla Backpack. So beyond that, uh, that's that's probably next week, starting next week. So I'm excited. <laughs> Hooray, yeah. Uh, well, I'm looking into Thanks. just a, a, a brief pilot potentially uh, for, for one or two courses uh, within the PharmD program at, at the University of Florida, but not yet sure I need, need to find some funding for that. Um, okay, since we at the end, I, I think I have to cut it short here a little bit. I apologize about that. Uh, but I think what we discussed um, was, was great. I appreciate the input from Erica and Dave. And I hope that those who were not able to uh, attend the conference or the symposium this year uh, got a little bit of insight out of this. Uh, I will be posting some of the presentations that I was able to record uh, as soon as I've uh, got them edited. Uh, and we'll, we'll post them online. Uh, and we'll announce that on the LinkedIn and also through our um, through our email newsletter that we will send out. Okay, uh, well, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, and uh, I don't know what's coming up in July, uh, but uh, I will find a presenter uh, that will be able to, to present on a topic and I will all let you know uh, what that topic is gonna be. All right. Okay, thank you everybody. Thanks so much, Oliver. Oh, thank you, Erica. <laughs> Thank you all. Take care.